Let us start. We, we are behind, you know, schedule a few minutes, but I hope that uh, at the end we'll be able to, to catch up. And uh, now uh, we have the honor to have Professor uh, Kaushik Basu uh, talking on a very, very interesting issue. The title of his uh, presentation is The Origin and Impact of the Global Financial Crisis on Poverty and Capability in the Eurozone. Well, uh, most of you know Professor Basu. He's a senior vice president and chief economist at the World Bank. He is on leave from uh, Cornell University, where he's uh, professor of economics. And uh, it's very difficult for me to make uh, even a short presentation of his career and his work from a CV of uh, 25 pages. I had many, many difficulties in selecting parts of his career or, uh, or of his publications. He's a fellow of uh, the Econometric Society, has published widely in the areas of development economics, industrial organization, game theory, and welfare economics. I tried to count the books he has published or edited. I ended up with 25, and about 200 uh, articles and papers. Uh, I would suggest, however, that uh, all of you should read his most recent book on Beyond the Invisible Hand. Uh, this is uh, a fascinating book. Uh, I re I'm, I'm reading the book now and I'm really enjoying it. So, uh, uh, I am very, very anxious to hear Professor uh, Basu talking about uh, the, the, the impact of the global uh, crisis in in, in Eurozone, and from the abstract of his paper, I thought that it was written particularly for Greece, because huge increase in unemployment, immigration of the most talented people, poverty is going up, and of course his remark that if we take as a benchmark, not the median income during the crisis, but the before the crisis level benchmark for, for poverty, then uh, that percentage in Greece, with some uh, calculations made by my, my colleague at the University of Athens, Athens Kaplanoglu, may be now with the most recent in the area of 35 to 40%. So, Professor Basu, uh, we are waiting for your uh, very, very interesting presentation. Vasilis, um, Enrica, friends, uh, it just uh, feels wonderful to be back again at an HDCA gathering and also to be here in Greece. For me, actually, Greece is, this is my first visit to Greece, so a very important touchdown for me. Thank you for giving me uh, this opportunity. Uh, my plan is to give a, a somewhat unusual talk, as uh, Dr. Rapanos already um, hinted to you. I am going to combine my um, recent experience very much in the sort of hands-on policy world with some more micro foundational questions and impacts. And in particular, what I'm going to look at is um, the global financial crisis, the Eurozone crisis, and its impact on well-being and capability at the ground level for Eurozone countries, but in particular Greece, it's right. I'm going to look at Greece in some detail. And I have to say that for me, there was some revelation when I started burrowing in, because most of the discussion of the global crisis takes the form of uh, the macro figures. You look at the growth rates, you see growth rate dropping one year, two year, in the case of Greece, six consecutive years of negative growth rate. And of course, you're very concerned about that. But once you begin to burrow in and see what that's doing to the standard of living of ordinary people, what that's doing to the distribution, to PISA scores, how are they doing in their maths performance, you get a shockingly greater revelation of what's going on in the, the, those micro details. 
And I feel somehow, because the discourse in economics is so separated between the macroeconomists with macro policy concerns and microeconomists with welfare concerns, that there has been too little attention paid to these two sides. Um, just to put the so final uh, cards on the table on the um, um, economy of Greece, generally, as you in this audience, all of you will know, it's been six very, very difficult years. The forecast coming around from Bretton Woods organizations and here is that this year, after six years of negative growth, uh, you will probably see a positive growth, a small one, 0.6% growth in GDP. And during my last three days uh, here, uh, I've been doing an intensive survey on the Greek economy with various taxi drivers uh, <laughs> all over. Uh, one warning with that is that Greek taxi drivers, I discovered, when they converse with you, they turn their head fully <laughs> to look at you and uh, talk. Extremely disconcerting, but from the skill with which they drove, I think they have a side vision because uh, they never deviated from that. But it was very, very evident that uh, all of them were talking in terms of uh, the customer level uh, has gone up. They are being hailed all the time. Many of them were actually very, very well versed on property prices. So property is beginning to rise, but these things you will see in statistics. The tourism boom this year that is taking place, which is being recorded very widely, is indeed very, very uh, remarkable. So probably the economy is going to inch upwards, uh, positive growth. I feel this year it may go to past 0.6%, a bit higher than that. Next year, it is to be seen some dispute in opinion, ranging from about 1% to 2.5% is the sort of range of forecast that I've seen. That's the sort of broad macro picture. What I plan to do here on is give you a description of the crisis coming on. And the reason I'm giving this to you is there was, for me, a lot of learning since I went into the policy world, mainly macro policy world starting from very micro-theoretic research. And there was a lot of the language of macroeconomists did not make sense, so I had to decipher things for myself. I'm going to give you a brief picture of the global crisis, how it came on, what we understand about it, and lots that we do not understand, and then burrow in and look at the uh, welfare impact. So with that, let me move on. Yes. So here is just the broad macro picture of what happened to the global economy. And you can see this, 2008-9, um, and I'm tracking over here the euro area. The growth rate just plunges down. Things that happened before that, and I will go back to that a little bit, is um, starting actually about two years before that from 2007 and blowing up in 2008 was uh, the subprime housing crisis in the United States. Uh, that led to uh, the credit drying up in the US, and the credit drying up the way it takes place, uh, I really realized how powerful this is once I went into the policy world. Even doing international trade, when you're sending your goods abroad, there's a short period of credit involved. Either the buyer, a person sitting in New York who's buying Indian goods, pays you in advance before getting the goods, or uh, you send the goods in advance and then wait for the payment to come. So there is a short bridging period during which you need credit. And if you don't get that credit, that credit dries up. It begins to impact the real economy very, very quickly because the trade begins to collapse just because that little bit of credit has gone down. And I have to say, when the crisis first began, and that time I was at Cornell, very much in the world of research. My own life was not being affected by the financial crisis at all. And I used to wonder if this is for real or not. And the Economist magazine had a very beautiful article saying that what's happening right now is a bit like the plumbing system in a home beginning to get clogged up which is not affecting you right now. Your water is still flowing, but specialists know that it's beginning to clog up. Suddenly, when the clog up reaches a critical level, you will feel it in real terms. And of course, that was very, very palpable, because in 2009, 
the crisis was uh, full range, and uh, I actually, that's when I moved to India um, to advise the government, and the crisis by then had arrived in India. So, a few more macro features of the crisis. Um, you will see uh, the Eurozone area, the debt buildup that takes place. From 2007, 2008, the debt is beginning to go up. Public debt to GDP ratio is very high, and the fiscal deficit in these countries also go up. And here is the fiscal deficit picture. Deficit goes up, meaning uh, the plunge downwards is the deficit going up. Uh, the line that you see around 2010 that the plunge is taking place. And this is again easy to understand is once the global crisis came on, starting with the US um, housing crisis, more, uh, subprime, then the U Eurozone sovereign debt, and on this I have something to say, because I feel that though the Eurozone crisis was triggered by the American subprime crisis, there were fault lines in the construction of the Euro pro project, which got revealed subsequently which caused the Eurozone problem. So sometime or the other, there would have been a Eurozone problem. It got sparked off by the US credit situation. What's happening 2009-10, when you see the fiscal situation getting worse in these countries, it's primarily to do with the fact that the government is stepping in with a very Keynesian policy. And G20 was spearheading this, urging all governments including the developing country governments, India as a part of G20, stepped up its fiscal deficit. All the fiscal def deficits were rising, and that's what you're seeing over there. The most important picture, and this is the one I'm going to explain a little bit, and to me, this is the crux of the Eurozone problem. I'll come back to it in a moment. But I want to say a word about macroeconomic policy as an outsider. No longer quite fully an outsider, but I was still, um, I actually went into this exercise. When you hear macroeconomists talking at length, if you raise the repo rate, this is what's going to happen to inflation. If you uh, go in for operation twist, you will have the unemployment going up. A lot of it is indeed knowledge, but a lot of it is also the very speculative. And if you try to scrape in and try to understand what is beneath this language, where all of them are speaking the same language. So for an outsider, it's very easy to think that they all have a deep understanding because they are understanding one another. <laughs> but actually, very often they don't. And I think I have enough economics to feel that this is just a common language of the profession. So they understand one another. It's a bit like astrology in the 17th century. People conversing would follow one another. Outsiders would feel very left out they are not, that they are not following. And we know in retrospect that they were, maybe they were genuinely feeling that they've got some deep knowledge of the movement of the stars and life. But in retrospect, we know that no, they did not. Macro is a mixture of these two. Uh, uh, there is a lot of knowledge. But there is also a lot of speculation. And I'm not saying that this is actually done deliberately at all. If you're a part of that world, this becomes the language that you're speaking at all times. Deliberately, I have to tell you, uh, uh, cut with one digression. I've had one relative in my uh, family who was an astrologer, an uncle of mine in Calcutta. And he, on his wall, had a very proud letter displayed around 1960, 61. This was from President Kennedy congratulating him for correctly forecasting using his astrological techniques about President Kennedy's electoral victory. <laughs> but another uncle who did not like him told us, we were very young, that this uncle had used a foolproof strategy of getting a letter from America because he had sent an identical forecast to Nixon. <laughs> so no matter what the outcome of the election, there would be a letter on his wall. Now, I'm not claiming it is that with uh, um, uh, astrology or for that matter with a lot of macro monetary policy, but I have to tell you, which I do believe, that a part of this is the profession's common language and uh, many of these policies work, but not because there is a deep understanding of what the repo rate does to prices or the unemployment, 
but by evolution. If you keep using rules and certain policies, the bad ones fall out over time. And you know that a particular move on the interest rate by the central bank with some margin of error is working in a certain direction. And you begin to use this rule, the bad ones fall out. So through evolution, you're doing the right thing, not that you have a full understanding of this. And there is a lesson, certainly for developing countries, but even for Greece. Most of our macro monetary policy, the things that we do, are really lessons taken from the Bank of England, from the US Fed. You, you know what they do when there is inflation or where there is, when there is unemployment. But I feel these policies need to be nuanced much more for your local context. This India that I know very well, I feel that there are situations where we don't want to move the same way that Fed would move with an inflation raging. Because also today's world is a small world. One country's monetary policy impacts another country. Most developing countries are policy takers. The big countries make their moves. Their policies impact on you. So they are very differently placed from the big countries. And their policies need to be more experimental and different. And that has to be kept in mind. Come back to this figure now. And the fault line is very interesting to see. What you're seeing in these graphs, you don't need the details. It's the borrowing cost by the sovereigns. The governments are borrowing money. And their cost of borrowing is from 1990 to 2008, sorry, 1999, the, Euros, uh, the um, uh, euro coming into existence, to 2008. All the eurozone governments are borrowing at the same cost. Then something happens in 2008, and the borrowing costs just open up. The spike up there is Greece. The borrowing cost shoots up for the Greek government. Next, I think, is Portugal. And the bottom is a cluster of countries where the borrowing cost is actually going down a little. Germany is a part of that. And what's happening is important to understand. And this was the fault line. With the construction of the Eurozone, there was a sense that now that it's a monetary union, whoever you lend to, to Greece or to Germany or to Spain, it's a union that is borrowing your money. And so the risk is the same. This, of course, if you re read the Maastricht Treaty or the Treaty of Lisbon, it's immediately clear that is not the case because one country cannot step in for another country. ECB can't step in. But these are matters of psychology. You treat the whole group as a union, so it's equally safe. And the lending money to Greece, to Portugal, to Germany, to France, you treat as the same. And the line is remarkable up to 2008 all of them borrowing at the same cost. Once the trouble started with the United States, a realization came about that, look, the way the Treaty of Lisbon is written up, and before that, the Maastricht Treaty, is that this is a monetary union. This is not a fiscal union. It is possible for one government to say that we will not be able to pay you back your money anymore. Uh, I borrowed from you, but I can't pay you back. Uh, uh, it's my responsibility, and the ECB need not act and other parts of Europe need not act. As soon as that realization comes, the borrowing costs of governments open up like a, one of those fans with a common stem and then opens up totally. And this precipitates a crisis also for the following reason. From 1999 to about 2008, all these governments were borrowing with this very low cost of borrowing, which means they were over borrowing. And indeed, part of the rapid growth that you saw Greece was growing very rapidly, you must remember, in the early years. Part of it is genuine. It is catching up with the rest of Europe. Part of it is also that there is an artificially low borrowing that is going on. So the crisis comes, the debt builds up, and the crisis figures you already saw from 2008. The uh, GDP growth is plunging. The debt is building up. Fiscal deficit is very large. These countries are on their own. The good news is that this fault line, which got discovered subsequently, now there is an understanding across the board. A banking union, there is effort to bring about a banking union. Very feeble effort, I have to say. The um, uh, resolution mechanism that is being talked about, to me, it's too small. 55 billion euros is not a large enough packet for such a big region. But at least the moves are in the right direction. So there is some hope. The fault lines are understood. But you know, the construction of the Eurozone is such a big, deliberate construction by human beings. 
earlier, all the innovations you think of, little bits of money happening, changing in credit card system, most of these are small innovations taking place and spreading through the world. Eurozone is a deliberate construction. And it's not surprising that some flaws will show up, and there will probably be other flaws that will show up, but there is hope now that there is understanding. But we have to put the understanding into action. One tiny bit of theory I will inflict you and move on. Uh, this is a work that I've done, but with one picture I'll be able to explain to you. Credit, when it begins to dry up a little bit, you get this massive drying up that takes place. So credit shortage occurs. The details of this I will not go into through the um, uh, subprime crisis in the United States. When the credit begins to dry up a little bit, suddenly you get credit almost vanishing. Why does that happen? This is important to understand, and this is a little bit of micro theory I will inflict on you. If you allow for a, this is the supply of credit, um, the vertical axis, which if I can move this picture down without having it disappear altogether, yeah. Yeah, the, it's a interest rate and the total amount of credit. Our usual supply curve when we draw, it's an upward sloping line. But with a little bit of algebra, very simple algebra, you can show that if there is a product where you take your decision based on other people's behavior. So I'm going to lend money to you if I feel others are willing to lend money to you. And in banking, this is well known. You don't look two ways. If everyone else is lending money, you lend money. India faced this up to 1991. India had a glut of international money coming to India. India was considered safe, and most banks and international groups were not doing detailed analysis. They were looking over their shoulder and seeing others are lending money, so I may as well lend. As soon as you have this kind of a behavior of watching one another, a supply curve can look very peculiar. It can rise, fall, and rise again. And through very natural mechanisms, Gary Becker has a story about restaurant queues, which is the same story, that you choose your restaurant depending on other people's choice of restaurants very often. And you can get for restaurant, demand for restaurant, you can get wobbles of this kind for the same reason. So there's nothing artificial going on. If the supply curve is like this, toss in a demand curve into that. Demand for credit goes down. Uh, it's downward standard demand curve. What happens is you have two stable equilibria with this demand and supply curve. The two equilibria are at E1 and E2. Suppose the economy is in equilibrium E2. So supply is equal to demand, plenty of credit. Now I'll have, for some reason, credit supply falling a little bit. So I'm going to make the supply curve move left a little bit. The new supply curve is SN. It's the old supply curve, but I've moved it down a little bit. I've moved it left a little bit, supply has gone down. That little change in supply, however, means that the equilibrium at E2 has vanished altogether, nothing in the vicinity of that. The next equilibrium is at EN, huge drop in credit that takes place. And at one intuitive level, you can understand, if lending is dependent on one another, herd behavior, then when it begins to shrink, this herd behavior magnifies that, and credit can drop very, very rapidly. And when I joined the Indian government in the end of 2009, 2010, the credit market had just dried up. Trade was suffering, everything was suffering because the credit market had dried up. So this, in a nutshell, is what happened. Move now to the current situation and the micro. Um, I want to now borrow in and uh, focusing on the Eurozone, but Greece in particular. So this was the macro picture and a little bit of the theory story as to what happened. Once you begin to disaggregate and look at what's happening at the level of individuals, their well-being, their capacity to live decent lives, their functionings, you will see a picture which is actually quite remarkable. This, this, then this and the next one is probably known to all of you. This is the unemployment data. The, high one is Greece, the unemployment going very high. As you know, the next one is Spain. There are two countries where unemployment rate um, goes uh, very high. Let me just get the right figure for myself. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, okay. Unemployment is picking up in all these countries. So as you saw, the growth rate uh, drops off. And as the growth rate drops off, unemployment picks up in all these countries. And unemployment is going just very, very high. 27.5% Greece, 26% or so for Spain. And, it's, and these are for people who are looking for jobs. There could be people who are not even looking for jobs. They are giving up. In the United States, that's been dominant. One more underlying feature of this unemployment has to be pointed out is, um, I don't know the details of the Eurozone, though I think it's very similar. Of those who are unemployed, long-term unemployed, in Greece, I think you use a year as a long-term unemployment. In the United States, you use six months as long-term unemployment, has become disproportionately large. And that typically there's enough micro study to show it causes erosion in skills. So there's probably some erosion in skill taking place, which is going to have very long run effects on the United States economy, on economies over here. If of the unemployed, some people are unemployed for a very long term, there some of their job related skills begin to go down. Another disaggregation of this unemployment is youth unemployment, which is just astronomically high, it's over 50% for Greece and Spain. So again, this is talking to the same thing that I said. Newcomers are finding it difficult to break into this. And if you spend too long a period without work, it does do some damage to your productivity. There is another category that is used in the Eurozone called neat youngsters. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Not in employment, education, or um, what's the T? Training. training. Employment, education, or training. Uh, that proportion has also gone up. People who are not in any of these categories. I prefer the term NEET to what we use in India. We call them nowhere young youngsters. Those who are not in employment nor in education, the Indian official data will describe them as nowhere youngsters. Over here, you describe them as neat uh, youngsters. That proportion has also gone up. So they are not in education, they are not in employment. So this has long run implications. Poverty. I'm giving you the official figure. This is what's happening on poverty using the way poverty line is done here, which is, uh, let me just explain. You take the 60% of the median income as the poverty line, and the top part of the graph gives you what's happening to the poverty line itself. And you can see that from 2010 to 2012 for Greece over there, the 60% of the median income, that line has gone down, which means, of course, the median income has gone down. So the poverty line has gone down simply because the median income has dropped. And you know, it's a pretty sharp drop in the median income that, has taken, that is taking place. Drop down to the lower figure and you will see what's happening to the actual poverty and concentrate on the line on Greece. In 2010, it is about 20% who are poor. In 2012, two years later, this was a very difficult uh, time for Greece, it is 24% of the people are poor. So from 20% to 24% in a two year period. But this is a bit deceptive in one way. Over here, the poverty line is what it's supposed to do. It's a relative poverty line. So it's 60% of the median in each year. But given that that poverty line is dropping, what you could do is go back, hold the poverty line where it was, and then recalculate this, and you will find that poverty has gone up to over 30%. This is the figure for that. Poverty is actually 33%, 32.6% uh, is the poverty. If you freeze the poverty line at the 2009 level. So do you get it? What's happening is that if you take the relative poverty line, poverty is increased. But if you hold the poverty line constant, it's increased even more. Because the country as a whole has lost, uh, lost something. But if you don't make allowance for that, the poverty has gone up quite a bit. So this is the story in terms of poverty and the youth being hit in terms of employment. Okay. Um, this is the neat figure that I told you, which in um, Greece, in the case of Greece, there's a sharp deterioration in uh, youngsters who are not in employment, education, or training. Yes. Um, let me, yeah, okay. Interesting little sub-themes where 
the causalities we do not know. In fact, I generally have great doubts about any statement of causality. Causality in the end is very, very difficult to get a handle on. For this one, even more so about causality. If you look at the PISA scores uh, for reading mathematics and science, in the case of Greece, for all these three between 2009 to 2012, there is a worsening of performance taking place. This is just educational performance. This is the deepest period of the crisis. Now, it's possible that many other things, of course, drive these scores, but it's also possible it's connected to this because there was another piece of information for Greece which is very important. I hope I'm getting the figures right. It is that um, if you take the children, of all the children, meaning from zero to 17 years old, living in households where no one has employment. This used to be 3.6% in 2008, and by 2011 or 12, I'm, uh, it's the figure I can give you exactly, it's 12.6%. So dramatic increase in children living in households where no one has employment. And you know, if you have 12.6% of households where children are living with no one employed, means your education is beginning to suffer, your what books you buy, if you go for an evening lesson somewhere else, which I'm told there's quite a bit of that, that's beginning to suffer, and the entire household is under stress because no one has employment. Long time ago, I had done work with an American student of mine, Patrick uh, Nolan, showing that being unemployed and being unemployed in a household where everyone is unemployed are actually two totally different things. To be in a household where you're unemployed but someone else has employment makes a huge difference. You have access to the world, you have some money coming in, but if you are unemployed and living in a household where everyone is unemployed, it really accentuates the implications of this unemployment. And that figure which I just quoted to you, maybe I'm getting it a tiny bit wrong, but it's 3.6 or 3.8 to 12.6 or 12.8 is the children in these households, it's OECD uh, data, which shows that there may be something to this which is not just coincidence, the worsening of this. I'm going to just um, not inflict too many of these because I want to discuss a little bit of policy, so let me actually uh, manage my time. If I take another five minutes, is that all right? Uh, I want to hear Enrica's comments and if there are questions. So um, this is what I will do. Let me actually switch over to a little bit of discussion of policy and what do you do um, in this situation. First, some lessons from a wider um, context is that um, so much of our discussion uh, in policy today, thanks to the fact that the global crisis is being handled mainly by macroeconomists with macro concerns, that a lot of it is to do with the aggregates. The targets we are setting is fiscal deficit targets. We are setting targets on aggregate debt to GDP ratio. But as this shows, as this uh, analysis shows, there's a lot happening beneath that to do with the microstructure of the impact. To which one of the first things which I feel, and this is where the, I, the World Bank's bottom 40% of society criterion plays a role, is there's been a huge amount of debate on whether to have fiscal austerity or not. I know it's been very, very heated in your country, it's been heated everywhere. But to me, the discussion in terms of whether more austerity or less austerity is rather sterile because it's overlooking the most important thing. When you've had a period of excessive spending, some form of austerity has to take place. Who takes the cut is controversial, but some austerity has to take place. But it's the micro distribution of that austerity. Is it the youngsters looking for jobs who feel the biggest shock, or the big banks who feel the bigger shock? That structure needs much greater attention. And it's the distribution of austerity which needs to be talked about, needs to be analyzed, because the same average level of austerity is good or bad, depending on how you're distributing this. Some pieces of work beginning to come out from uh, other contexts, India, Kenya, Michael Kramer's work on Kenya, showing that what kinds of micro-interventions you go for can have big implications for fiscal policy. And this is to do with, there are certain forms of, uh, when there's a problem of well-being and welfare 
of the poorest segment of a society, say the bottom 40% of a society, this can happen in two different ways. Certain kinds of damages transmit from one generation to another. And if those damages, you allow those damages to happen, then in fact you will need fiscal support for the next 20 years because you've, you've done damage, so you need fiscal support. Whereas if you can direct your fiscal support to areas where it is costly today, but it's going to free people in terms of their productivity, their capacity in the next generation or 10 years down the road, then that fiscal burden is a one-time fiscal burden. And lots of examples of this uh, in different areas. Uh, we know there's this uh, beautiful study by um, Martinson et al. in Journal of Economic Psychology, very well-controlled study, that um, children, this was done for children born, uh, nine months old to two years, nine months old, over a two-year uh, uh, period uh, for, in poor households where the children do not get adequate amount of the basic needs that they have in Kenya. Uh, there would be college, trained college students who are sent, and these were a bit of a, a students with an actual zeal, to talk to the children, to get them to laugh and play games and teach the parents to do that. These, students were being sent once a week only to these households. Play with the children, train the parents that you have to interact with these children. Don't just leave these children for two years, from nine months to two years, nine months. The researchers went back to the same children, the same cohort, uh, 20 years later, and the children who had received this tra treatment had a cut above per capita income than the ones who had not received this treatment. It had done things to the minds of these children to cause a difference in their performance. It's not surprising. We intuitively feel this way, but this is a very controlled study where the same children they visited after 20 years and tracked and got this. There are other kinds of big data uh, numbers that are coming out. There is Raj Chetty's work in the United States showing that if in uh, lower high school you replace a bad teacher with a good teacher, these are all very well defined and again very well controlled uh, study. For one year, if you bring in a good teacher, this class's lifetime income goes up by 1.4 million dollars. These children will earn more in their life if you bring in a better teacher for that one year and if you do multiple years presumably, it won't multiply that many times but there will be positive effects that are taking place. There are many studies now about these things which play out after a long period. So if the interventions can be targeted in ways where it may be costly today, but it is going to free the government's burden five years down the road, 10 years down the road, even 20 years down the road. After all, it's your own government, it's your own people. Those interventions are much less costly in the long run because you don't have to go in for repeat interventions to support these people, their children, their children's children, if you get these correct notes, for which you have to descend from the macroeconomic perch to do a much more detailed analysis of the microeconomic impact of these various forms of difficulties in life which emerge with a crisis of the kind that Greece is facing but many other countries are facing. And for that matter, it's worth reminding that for many developing economy, emerging market economy like India, what appears to be a crisis here is a normal life. I mean, uh, worse than a normal life because a whole lot of people live in, of course, abject chronic poverty, so it does not make headline news, but nevertheless, it is very, very important. This, of course, reminds me of Amartya's uh, work on famines and chronic um, um, as, as suffering. The chronic suffering does not get written about, uh, no one makes noise, and you can understand that. Which day's headline in the newspaper will talk about a chronic uh, food shortage problem, so no day's headline says that, whereas a big sudden news, of course, attracts a lot of attention. Um, one more word, and I'm going to stop with that, so literally two minutes, is that um, there are also domains where you have multiple equilibria. I will not go into the details of this. And the, actually the uh, credit picture that I showed, there are two different equilibria in the original picture. A lot of credit, very little credit. credit. Those are also areas where if the fiscal intervention is focused on shifting the economy from one equilibrium to another, then in the next period, you don't need a government fiscal impetus because you have moved the economy to an equilibrium. So if an economy has two equilibria, good equilibrium and bad equilibrium, lots of children working, 
no children working, if both these happen to be equilibria, then when you look at a government program to sh deflect the economy from one equilibrium to another, you should realize that it's a one-time cost because it's very similar to the point I was making, but with multiple equilibria, you can throw it off there. But these are the micro studies which need to be done better. This is a paper which I actually got interested working for this conference, and I have not a, do not have a written up paper, but do plan to actually write up a paper now. It's the wrong way to do it, to give the lecture and then to write it up. But I do plan to write it up, so to that extent, your comments will be very, very valuable to me. Thank you very much. Well, Kaushik, thank you very, very much for your very, very insightful uh, intervention. Uh, before uh, giving the floor to uh, uh, Henri uh, Enrica Chiapero Martinetti, I would like to take a couple of points uh, raised by, by uh, Kaushik. And the first is the problem of credit. What really happened in Greece uh, was very, very important because uh, Troika suggested increasing exports, but most exporters, most producers of uh, trade-ups, exportables, used imported inputs. So the credit period from the suppliers of Greek importers vanished immediately after the crisis. So the producers went to banks for extra borrowing. Banks did not have the money to give them. Or credit letters, guarantee letters of, by Greek banks were not accepted by foreign banks. So this was a very, very important factor that contributed very importantly to the recession of the Greek economy and the reduction in production. This is an aspect that was totally neglected by Troika or other, other analysts. And I was thinking when listening to, to Kaushik, how would be different, if it could be different, if the senior economic advisor of the World Bank was at the IMF? <laughs> I don't know if this would have made any difference. But certainly, uh, uh, he could tell those people that uh, transplanting models and policy uh, recipes from one country to the other may be very dangerous. And to some extent, it happened also in Greece. Anyway, uh, I could take many, many points and comment on them, but we have a very, very very, very good discussion, so I would like uh, to ask Enrica to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, as you can imagine, it's quite hard to speak after such a brilliant speaker and or to command the broad empirical evidence that he shows us. So I would be very grateful if you can be sympathetic with me. And the only chance that I have to minimize the damage is to try to be very, very brief. Um, so. As a rich and very inspiring uh, uh, presentation clearly shows, the need to tackle with the risk exposure of vulnerable people to negative and persistent shocks is clearly shown by the impact that the recent economic and financial crisis is uh, having in terms of losses of opportunities. This holds true for all generations, but is especially alarming for young people, as you also show, who are experiencing some of the most profound hardships, in particular in the labor market sphere. Despite the relative high investment in education for the younger generation, many a European countries, uh, in many European countries, young people are more exposed to vulnerable living conditions and precarious labor market uh, positions, and they have definitely less opportunities compared to their parents. This is something that the human capital theory is not able to explain how, how this is possible, or how, why this has happened. 
In the European Mediterranean countries, the youth unemployment rate is higher than the total unemployment rate, sometimes more than twice as high. It rises faster, and the duration of youth unemployment is also steadily increasing, becoming a persistent trade. So the impact of the economic crisis uh, uh, on unemployment is the result of the interaction of multiple structural, institutional, and social factors that produce, reproduce, and exacerbate differences in terms of circumstances and opportunities. These differences are, in fact, even more evident once you are going inside the box and looking to the international regional inequalities, as well as for your know, Concentrated, concentrated the attention to some specific subgroup of population. For instance, you didn't include Italy in your uh, the set of countries that you were uh, presenting, but of course, Italy is a pretty similar situation like Greece or like Spain, particularly in terms of youth unemployment rate. Uh, so if you look at the youth unemployment rate in the age of the age range of 15, 24 years, uh, we have values, rates that are close to 39%, which are amazing, but they can be also above 50% in the south and can reach something like the 60% when you are focusing the attention on low educated women in the south. So it's simply unbelievable. Um, so even if this crisis would stop it today, we, uh, what we have is a sort of a lost generation that you will not be able to rescue or to try to uh, be uh, included in the labor market in a proper manner. So mainstream economics does not seem to be able to provide a full account of uh, these uh, complex facts. So I have two points that I would like to raise to your attention, Koshik, uh, uh, because the title of your presentation was aimed to describe and to discuss it, these figures in the light of the capability approach, particularly in terms of the consequences that these figures or these facts can produce in terms of capabilities. So the first question is, uh, how is a question not just for you, but for the whole community, because I think that we need to have an agenda for future research on this, in this sense. So the first question is how the capability approach can effectively contribute to highlight these elements of complexity to identify these uh, multiple causes and to help us to investigate the plural consequences that the economic crisis already produced is uh, still manifesting, is still producing, and will generate in the near future, particularly for the most vulnerable group. Um, I think that there are two main elements of distinctions that can guide our research. The first one is the clear shift from the idea to representative agent to the knowledge of human diversity and the importance of taking into account individual characteristics, heterogeneity of context, and how this plurality of factors combine and interact each other. Uh, generating basically different circumstances and therefore different opportunities, uh, which is a, this is a surely a distinct, distinctive feature of the capability approach. I think that really this is an important value added for us. Uh, this also suggests that it's important to go well beyond the averages and to refine our analysis in order to be able to describe this complexity and to investigate on this uh, complex relationship. So, there are concepts such as horizontal inequalities, intersectionality, conversion rates that are already well elaborated in our disciplines and more and more in, often included in our conceptual, uh, conceptual and empirical analysis. So I think that this is a good direction in order to have a better understanding of this phenomenon. Uh, the second element of distinction that I can see in the capability approach is that is a shift from a simple money metric view toward a multiple dimensional perspective and the special attention paid to the interrelated dimensions of human well-being. Here again, uh, a remarkable attempt to formulate composite indicators or composite indices of poverty and well-being or to elaborate concepts such as corrosive disadvantages are just a few examples of, of how the capability approach can contribute to this debate. So there is a lot of potential on this regard, uh, but the second question that immediately raised in my mind is how and to what extent the capability approach is actually able to play 
an active and effective role in the current policy debate and can contribute to design national policies or to set up a European agenda, which is aimed to preserve, enlarge, promote human capabilities. Again, in the, if you look at the, the recent years, the most recent year, the last decade, an increasing attention has been paid to the capability approach in Western industrialized countries. Uh, after the Sarkozy Commission with the Stiglitz San to c report, a broad discussion, a broad debate has been uh, now currently, in, uh, currently developed in Europe. Other interesting experiences uh, uh, conducted in Europe, like the Equality and Human Rights Commission in Britain, or many national government uh, reports on poverty and equality and will be in uh, European countries, are clearly uh, inspired by or designed on the basis of the core principles of the capability approach and have been able to show us that is again there's a lot of potential in uh, trying to address the issues in a um, better and a much more complex manner. Similarly, a growing number of papers aimed to address these issues in industrialized countries has been published recently in the Journal of Human Development and Capabilities or have been presented in our conferences. And I think that this conference in Athens is a wonderful example of the interest and the need and importance to assume this perspective for debating the current critical situation and hopefully identify possible solutions. In the last year, the European Commission has also shown a clear and noticeable interest on this approach, funding several research projects inspired by or explicitly rooted in the capability approach. Many people and many friends sitting in this room contributed or are actually engaged in this project, and in many cases under the leadership of our co-organization uh, leader, uh, Anne-Sive Otto at the Bielefeld University. Let me just briefly mention two current uh, European projects. One is led by Anne Suve, the name is, uh, is, the, is called Society, Social Innovation Empowering the Young for the Common Good, and is uh, exactly aimed to re-examine the concept of disadvantage and inequalities, plural through the lens of the capability approach, to identify personal and contextual factors that can determine disadvantageous conditions and unequal opportunity, particularly for young people in the capability and in the functioning space. Uh, a second project uh, coordinated by the Said Business School in Oxford with the leadership of Alex Nichols, and the name of this project is uh, Cressy, is aimed to conceptualize the meaning of social innovation into a broader framework also inspired by the capability approach. So it seems to me that now there is a new and uh, growing uh, uh, debate in Europe. Uh, all these initiatives, in fact, the conferences, the research projects, uh, papers, and um, books that have been recently published represent an interesting and important step and are strategically crucial for bridging our perspective into the European debate. However, I think that the European debate is still largely uh, monopolized by or dominated by uh, poor economic performance, economic indicators, and it seems that particularly in this time of crisis, the attention is very much concentrated on this aspect, and probably not enough on the consequences of this empirical and economic effect in the future, in the present and the future generation. So I'm just trying to conclude this quick comments. I think that there is really more need to invest resources, time, and energies uh, in these two different directions. First, developing further concept, method, empirical research. And there is one point that, for instance, I think that there is a lot that is really under-researched in our disciplines, that is the uh, capacity to offer impact evaluation methods and techniques directly connected to the capability approach. Till now, we are still making use of uh, other uh, impact evaluation methods that are not so uh, other way for taking into account the richness of this approach. And this is, of course, is something that refers to our individual contribution, the contribution that each of us as a researcher or as research groups can offer on this regard. 
The second point uh, is that is something that again is pertain to our uh, action, but I think that there is also room for something that refers to our academic community, namely our association, is to try to foster a little bit more the European debate and driving more, a more capability-oriented direction in, on this regard. So again, I think that it would be, I would love to see in other conferences like this one that is able, that are able to try to to set up an agenda, at least to, uh, to have a, um, an active role in setting up a European agenda which is able to preserve and promote and enlarge uh, human capabilities. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you to Koshin for your speech.